you were asking. But uh, while I'm answering, you might want to check on the volume issue. Uh, the question is really asking, uh, you know, is it, I, I see it as two questions. Um, is it the case that people of various religious traditions are just doing their best to figure out who God is, and we're all trying to kind of look at the same God, um, or are there different gods or some people just entirely confused or whatever? In my way of thinking, um, yes, most people are trying to reach out to understand ultimate reality. And as I think of ultimate reality, it includes God. And so various religious traditions and various people have different understandings of God. Um, and most of the time it's because they have good motives. It's not like they're, you know, being deceived or trying to fool people, but we're all trying to make sense of this uh, ultimate reality we call God. We just don't all have the same views of that. And that's to be expected because we're different kinds of people. It could also be the case, and I think it perhaps is, that um, over time we get greater clarity um, as I read scripture, I think there is a kind of developmental uh, development of ideas there. And when I read Jesus saying things like, you've heard it said, and then quoting the Old Testament and saying, but I say unto you, uh, it sounds like there's some change going on and uh, change for clarity's sake, a, a change for the better. I'm not saying, you know, Everything in the New Testament trumps everything in the Old Testament. I'm just saying in the Bible itself, there seems to be some development. Uh, does God evolve is, I think, the second question that I hear there. And I don't really like the phrase, does God evolve? I do think God's experience changes. I think God really learns new things as new things occur in, on, on earth and in the universe. And so in that sense, God is kind of growing in that sense. I wouldn't, but evolving sounds, it doesn't seem to me quite the right word. I want to say, though, as I mentioned in the video, that although God's experience changes and as new information comes to God, God learns, there's another aspect of God, God's nature or God's essence that is unchanging, that doesn't evolve. And so if we keep both the nature of God and the experience of God in mind, we can have the steadfast um, confidence in God's regularity, you might say, that, that, the, that God won't change in God's nature, while simultaneously believing there's a God who's engaging in real giving and receiving relationships with us and with all creation. All right, All right. Just, just like any one of us would have said. <laughs> really, really good. All right, so uh, I, think I think you should be able to hear me now through Zoom. Zoom. I, figured I figured out what I screwed up there, and then hopefully you all can still, still hear me out there. there. All right, good. good. Excellent. Excellent. All right, so, so second question. Um, this, this has to do with God's plan. plan. Uh, it, it is so, so easy to trust God when things, things are going well in your life. How do you trust without worry when storms come and seem unbearable? Someone, Someone called this blind, blind faith. faith. And, and what's God's plan if God only knows? There's two related issues. Questions. Questions. What's, what's God's plan if God only knows up to the current moment? Yeah, that now, word plan, boy, that's been a word that I've heard a lot in my history, and uh, I hear it a lot today. And what people mean by it varies. Some people, when they say God's plan, they have in mind every last detail of everything that's ever going to occur. God pre-planned it all out. God predestined it. And everything that happens since God is in control in their view, well, it must be a part of this plan. So that means, you know, Tom Brady deciding to retire. Well, that's been predestined from the foundation of the world that that's going to happen. Or something much worse, you know, some genocide, some uh, war, rape, murder, torture, whatever. All that stuff would have to be in the plan. Um, I don't find that helpful at all because I don't think a loving God would have plans that include such evil and destruction. However, I do feel okay about using plan language if we kind of tweak it a bit and don't think of it in terms of things being set in stone from the outset, but think of it in terms as God's goals for the future, what God wants to see happen. 
Um, you know, I, I like the parenting analogy here. When you have children, you want them to flourish. You want them to have a good life and a good future. But, you know, none of us, at least hopefully none of us, thinks that we can control every single thing our kid does or somehow foreknow what all is going to happen. Instead, we're doing the very best we can right now to help them to flourish right now and to prepare them for some of the possibilities of the future. I think that's a good way to think about God's plan. Of course, I think God knows all the possibilities in the future. So God's wisdom is far deeper than yours or mine. But as you all know from reading the book, I don't think God knows with absolute certainty everything that's going to happen in the future. And so things haven't been pre-planned, foreknown, foreordained. But that doesn't mean God is sort of, hey, you're on your own here. I've got nothing to do with this. No, I think God is working moment by moment, calling us, leading us, wooing us. I like that word you use, Pete, wooing us into flourishing for ourselves, for others, and for all creation. Oh, right. and I was going to oh, say ahead. something about the, the first part of that question. What was the, can you repeat that first part? I started with the plan and I was going to come to, back to something else. Oh, yeah. It's, it's easy, easy to, to trust, trust God when things, things are going well in your life. life. How, How do you, you trust, trust God, God without, without worry when storms, storms come that seem unbearable? Yeah, that's a tough. T- I totally can resonate with that um, because we all go through tough times in life. Um, not too long ago, about five, six years ago, I went through one of the most difficult times of my life in Uh, related to my job in which I was laid off in a way I thought was very unjust. And during that time, I had the view of God that I currently have, which says, God's not in control of things. This is not not a part of some blueprint of history, uh, but things are occurring that God didn't want to have. And although the struggle was real, and I was, me and my wife and my kids and colleagues, we really went through some hard and dark times. It was helpful to me <laughs> to believe that God wasn't controlling and orchestrating it all. <laughs> you know, um, if I had thought this was something God wanted done, I would have a hard time believing God's truly loving. But believing that God is with me in the midst of the struggle, that gave me real hope. And believing that it wasn't God's will for this, what I considered evil to be occurring, that helped me to trust in God's steadfast love. That's really helpful. And I I know know that you've got got skin skin in the game, game, that that you're you're speaking speaking from from real real experience, experience, not just just from, you know, know, your intellectual intellectual work. So thank thank you for that. that. Uh, This Uh, this is kind of related to plan. Uh, One One has has to do with God's influence on us. When I pray for guidance, I want a path or choice to be shown. But that doesn't happen all the time. Sometimes, Sometimes a thought, thought appears that I feel comes from God as I am not making it happen. I can, I can choose to follow that thought or ignore it, but guidance is different. How does God, God guide us in our daily lives? lives? And then a related question to that, but not from the same person. Uh, uh, does the Holy Spirit then have any influence over the writing of Scripture? And so how? Yeah, I really like these questions because the person who asked them used that word influence. Uh, Go back to my parenting example. I want to be a good influence upon my kids, but I don't control them. Um, And I shouldn't even try to because it's just impossible. When it comes to trying to figure out what God wants us to do moment by moment or kind of in a grand picture for our life, or even what God wants in terms of the writing of the sacred scriptures we call the Bible, I have no problem believing God is always influencing for the best. Um, I think, however, that we don't always understand that influence, and we don't get things right. In fact, that's part of the reason why I can criticize some portions of Scripture that paint God as unloving, because I simply say, look, I I think the people writing this, maybe we're doing their best, but they misunderstood what God wanted. And the same is true in our own moment-by-moment experience. So, How do we do a better job of hearing from God or listening or somehow responding? Well, here I think the Christian tradition and other religious traditions as well have tried to draw upon particular tools 
or experiences that can help us discern what God wants. And those things include the kind of thing we're doing right now, coming together as a group of people to think together, to worship, to pray, etc. It includes things we might do individually, like reading scripture and prayer or going on the hike I hiked yesterday, which I have this photograph. It includes trying to become more intelligent and wiser through education. I mean, I, we could just go on listing over uh, tons of different things that are not, none in themselves can give us absolute certainty that we know what God wants in any particular moment, but they can increase the likelihood we hear God's voice more clearly as we follow them or use those kinds of resources. I like that because it, it means, means that, that it's not, not necessarily, necessarily possible for us at any given time to totally box God in. We're doing the best we can, and, and we, we need, need to hold on lightly to the things that we're, we're so, so certain, certain about, about uh, because, because we're, we're still, still growing, growing and refining our thoughts uh, all along the way. way. That's well oh. put, Pete. Uh, yeah. I, I like to add something real quick there before we go to the next question. Um, I try in my own life to always kind of use qualifying words when I think that maybe God wants me to do something. I'll say something like, well, I believe God is leading me to do this. Because I'm sure you and most of the people who are watching this, you've run across people who were just absolute certain God wanted them to do something. And you look at it and you think, there's no way God wants you to kill your kid or whatever it is. Uh, but they have this certainty. I think we need to be much more humble. We don't have to throw out our belief that God is influencing us altogether, but we should be humble in how we articulate it. Well said. I completely, I completely agree. agree. Uh, next, uh, next question, question has to do with prayer. prayer. I, understand I understand that we, we are all connected. connected. However, However, how does my prayer truly help someone else? Is it just, just good energy? And if we pray for change or healing of some sort, can God, God really be affected and respond when God doesn't know the future? I understand God, God can't uh, single-handedly uh, heal, uh, but, but I think you get the gist of the, the question. question. Yeah. Uh, I like that this person was bringing in the notion that God can't know the future and still saying, okay, well, wh then would, what would prayer be like? And here I assume they mean petitionary prayer, asking God to do something. There's lots of forms of prayer. Um, let me see if I can give an analogy. It won't be perfect, but I'll give it my best shot. I have three daughters and one of them really a, was a good runner in cross country. And she would periodically, it seemed like every other month, she would run so much her shoes would go bad. And so we'd have to go get a new pair of shoes. Suppose uh, it's a Wednesday and she tells me, uh, she says to me, Dad, I really need a new pair of shoes. Uh, what do you say we go this Saturday to the running store? and get a new pair of Nikes. Those, you know, have been great. I love the, the options they have there. And I say, look, that sounds great. We've got the money. I care about your well-being. I want you to flourish. Let's go get some shoes on Saturdays. Get those Nikes. Well, let's say Friday, she does some research, and she becomes convinced that the Brooks brand is actually a better running shoe for her. And now she's open to the possibility of switching brands when we go to the store on Saturday. And we get in the car and start driving over and she turns to me and she says, dad, I know, I know that the Nikes have been good for us, but I'm kind of thinking the Brooks are a better way to go because they've got better support. They last longer. She lays out her argument and I'm like, well, let's give it a shot. We get to the store, we buy Brooks. Now what happened there? Maybe we can say that that's kind of like what prayer is like. God always wants the best for us. The best on Wednesday was Nikes, and that's what we wanted. And then it turns out something new, some new idea came here. Now, in my analogy, it doesn't quite work because Brooks would have been known by God on Wednesday, but you, hopefully you'll get the idea. That is, we request something and express our desires, and God wants what's good for us, and that then changes the outcomes of what happens. I think if we think about prayer like that, that our prayers actually make a contribution to the data that God takes in moment by moment, that means that while our prayers don't control God, 
It means that they provide new relational information that God can then use in the next moment. Now, in terms of how this affects people beyond us as individuals, if I'm praying for Aunt Matilda and her cancer, um, I just want to say in those in that kind of illustration that this relational information that God receives from us in our prayers, I'm not exactly sure how that's going to be used to help Aunt Matilda, but I have to believe, given this overall theory of a relational God and an interrelational universe, that in some cases that actually might make some kind of difference. Um, I have to admit that with this view of prayer, I tend to focus my prayers more in terms of petitionary prayers, more on the things that I might be able to influence than things that are far, far away. You know, <laughs> more of my prayers are, God, help me understand what I might do today that would be loving than they are, God, make sure the missionaries in China do something. I mean, just the realistic sort of way I pray. But I think even the ones praying for the missionary in China, at least in theory, can make a difference. It's just harder for me to imagine how it actually does so. Very yeah. good. Yeah, it's one of those so things that's profound. profound and we, we have, have uh, people, people in antiquity, antiquity and, and the biblical, biblical writing, writing talking, talking about how prayer, prayer is powerful, powerful and effective, effective. Uh, and, and people's experience throughout, but there's, there's still a lot of mystery and, and appropriate uh, about uh, how we understand that. that. Yeah. Okay, okay, one, one of the final questions, questions at least uh, in the pre-stuff, and if we have a second or two, if anybody has an additional question, we can uh, hear you out. All right, evil being a choice uh, is still a thing to be chosen. So we talked about, I kind of stole your analogy a couple of weeks ago with the diagram of the, the big circle and our choices in the circle, and that God is always influencing toward the best of choices and all that, uh, and that there are some mediocre choices and then, and then there, there are, are some really terrible, terrible choices. choices. So, so I, think I think what the person understands, understands that and agrees with that, with that. Uh, but, but they're, they're still, still recognizing that there's, there's a bad, bad choice, an evil choice, choice. maybe that, that language is clunky, that's, that's to, to be, be chosen. chosen. So, so her question is, is, where do those ideas, those evil or dark, dark ideas, ideas come from in this that, that, and open relation theological paradigm? Yeah, there's a number of answers I can give, but I, I think I'll try to give one that, that I sort of comes from my own perspective and say some open relational thinkers might have a, an alternative answer. So this is Tom's answer. <laughs> um, I think whenever there are options on the table that uh, some of those options can, at least in most circumstances, can be helpful and others can be unhelpful. And the greater the degree of complexity uh, we have, the more options before us. Some of the things, let's take, uh, well, this morning I was putting butter on my toast and I picked up a knife. It was a fairly sharp knife. Um, it was, I was using it to do something positive, but I could use that to do something pretty negative. I might try to stab the dog or something like that. Um, I, we all know that knives can be used for good or ill. The possibilities are there because of the nature of the thing. In that case, it's the knife and our agency to use the knife in various ways. So I think in the universe in which we're going to have genuine free will, there's always going to have to be options out there. And some of those options can be used for good and others for evil. Now, if we back that question up to like the beginning of creation, then we're getting some really interesting issues. And I address that kind of question, sort of the original creation question, in that uh, Questions and Answers for God Can't book in one of the chapters. And actually, for the person who asked the prayer question uh, just previously, there's a chapter on that in the book as well. So um, if you want to get nitty-gritty details, let me recommend those chapters. Very good. And a question, question related, related to the one, one we just, just asked on, on evil and where those things come, come from. from. How about, How about on, on the flip, flip side, side um, what, what kind of assurance, assurance about afterlife, afterlife uh, comes, comes from, from open and relational theology, we know and conventional theology? That's a very, very heavy focus is get your sins forgiven so that you'll be welcomed into heaven someday. And life may suck, but afterlife is awesome. Life is short, eternity is long, so get it figured out. Um, talk a little bit about that. What's the assurance of afterlife? Yeah. 
Well, here again, I'm going to speak from my perspective and not try to speak for every open and relational thinker. In my view, God always loves. And by always, I don't mean just now, even in the afterlife. I think God presents to us the possibility for love even after we die. I happen to believe in life after death. And that means we can say yes to love in the future. And God never gets to the place where he, God says, you know, I've given Pete 75 billion chances. I'm not going to give him 75 billion and one. He's toast if he says no this time. Nope. God's never going to give up on Pete or anybody else. And that means God's love is truly steadfast eternally. Uh, that's a massive hope. Now, if you're asking the question, how do we know there's an afterlife? Well, I'm not sure open and relational theology gives us any sort of extra evidence that other theologies don't have, except that I would say this, and this might sound a little controversial to some of you, maybe not to others. Um, open and relational thinkers want to take seriously experience as we know it, the evidence we have in our lives. And one really interesting set of evidence are near-death experiences. People whose hearts stop, who are declared dead, and then are revived. And the kinds of things they say happen to them in that limbo state, that near-death experience. Uh, for open and relational thinkers, we can take that stuff really seriously. It doesn't prove there's an afterlife, doesn't prove all this sort of stuff, but it's additional evidence to support the, the idea that even when our bodies die, we somehow continue to have subjective experiences beyond the death of our bodies. Great. Good stuff. Uh, I want to open, open it up, up to anybody, anybody uh, out in the audience. audience. Anybody, anybody have, have a, a burning, burning question, question that you uh, really want to ask? ask? Yeah, yeah, Matt. Matt. So, um, Traditionally, the Bible has been the place where we have moved toward, where we have offered for spiritual formation for people who are new to uh, encountering God. Would you say that's a good place to begin, or is there another beginning point? Uh, because, as you pointed out, the place in the Bible which are good representations of God and bad representations of God. How would you make sense of that? Did you catch yeah. that? I got that, yeah. I do think the Bible is a is it's in my view, it's the most important tool we have in spiritual formation. But we should always come to the Bible thinking about what it has to say and um, with the um, being open to having the Bible even critique itself. So, um, you know, sometimes, uh, well, here's a, here's a really interesting one. There are some passages of Scripture that talk about forgiveness and says God always forgives and we ought to be forgiving. But there's some other passages that in which God really doesn't forgive and comes down on wrath and wastes on people. So in those kinds of instances, we have to say, okay, what's the witness that we want to, to affirm here? Is the witness that God, you know, pretty forgiving on Monday, Tuesdays, and Fridays, but in the other way, other days of the week, not so much? Or do we want to make some kind of a claim about some of these passages get God right and others don't? So, Although I think the Bible is, in my view, our primary resource for understanding God, spiritual formation, what it means to be a human and live well in the world, uh, we should also read Scripture in light of the whole and in light of our deep intuitions, I think, guided by the Holy Spirit. Good stuff. That answer adequate, man? Okay. okay. Well, just to follow up, would be that our ultimate authority is not you know, what's in the Bible, but our own intuition. I heard our ultimate story is not in the Bible, but what do you say was the other? Uh, your own, own intuition. Gotcha, yeah. Yeah, well, that's where I want to say we need to bring in lots of resources. We need to bring in the church community. I'm a little bit worried, you know, if we place it all on our own individual heads and say, you know, you just have to listen to your own heart because, um, you know, I know sometimes when I listen to my own heart, I don't have a very good clue about what's going on. And I need good advice from wise people, from my wife, from others. 
Um, there's also a really strong part of the tradition that says that God is present throughout all creation and other disciplines. So we should listen to the sciences. We should listen to the arts and humanities. So um, it's, I, I don't want to put the onus on every individual to decide for themselves and not be open to any other resources. I want to say it takes a community. It takes ongoing reflection. Um, and, but that doesn't mean that somehow you know, the Bible is going to give us the right, clear, obvious answer, and you don't have to have any interpretation of it, or you don't have to have, um, and you should just believe whatever the plain reading of Scripture is, because in some instances, as I mentioned before, there seemed to be real conflict within the Bible. Good clarification. All right. I know nope. Matt well I enough. I know he agrees with that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> any, any other, other questions? questions? Yeah, I, I, I was intrigued by the thought that God's name would be unchanged, but God also evolved in relationship with us. And uh, we wanted to give us some biblical examples of uh, where that has happened, where that has worked. Yeah. Um, one of the ones that, uh, I, I don't remember if this was in one of the books or not, but, um, I like to point out because uh, when it comes to God being unchanging, there are usually two passages of scripture that people look to, to support that view. One is in the old Testament, uh, in which it says, I, the Lord do not change. And one is in the new Testament, uh, in the book of James, where it says, um, you know, God doesn't change. If you look at the passages, uh, you'll see in the Old Testament reference, the very next verse talks about God returning to the people if they return to God, which sounds like there's going to be a change in God's experience if they respond a particular way. So right there in the context, you have both a God who's unchanging and who's going to change if the people do whatever they want to do. Um, and then the James passage, just after it talks about God being unchanging, it says, every good and perfect gift comes from the Father above. And uh, the notion there seems to be that these gifts are coming in sequential order, uh, and there's some kind of responsiveness or giving and receiving that's happening there. Um, and so even in the very context of saying God is unchanging, that's also talking about God changing in some ways. But the kind of bigger context of Scripture, so many stories, God is affected by what happens. God is happy or mad or sad or joyful because the people obeyed or disobeyed, you know, depending on what's going on. And those seem to me very obvious examples of God having a change of mind. Um, and, you know, more than 40 times in the Old Testament, the writers say God repents, which is an old-fashioned way of saying God has a change of mind. So um, I, I, the idea that God's nature is unchanging, but God's experience changes, that exact language isn't in Scripture. But I think that language uh, d helps us to make sense of the variety of language we do find in the Bible. Very good. Adequate? Any follow-up follow on that? that or? Okay, so would you say that um, the example of Jesus would be an example of God's changing because it is related to Jesus? Because if we did, we had problems, marching in some of the world, but Jesus would like a completely different step. Yeah, I think I got the gist of the question. I didn't get all the answers, but it was some or all the details. But it was something like, uh, "Can we use Jesus as a model of what it means for God to be changing?" Was that right, Pete? Okay. Um, 
Yeah, you know, with Jesus, it's a really interesting case because the Christian tradition has affirmed Jesus as human and divine. Uh, but exactly what that means in what instance, you know, it's hard always to work out the details. Uh, for instance, you know, I and most Christians have thought God is omnipresent, but Jesus was at one place in one time. So, you know, what are you going to do there? Does Jesus reveal God is only in one place in one time? Or, you know, are there some sort of difference? When it comes to changing this, um, you know, I'm on the side that says Jesus is a real person with real experiences, and those experiences change moment by moment, and that fits well with who God is. So God is a person, an omnipresent person, but a person with experience that changes moment by moment. I think the best thing we can do for an analogy between Jesus and God when it comes to God's nature is to maybe say something like this. God's eternal nature is unchanging, just like most of us, not everybody, but most of us think there's something like a human nature. And Jesus had this human nature when he was a toddler, a teenager, and a 30-year-old person. Uh, he had that he was a human every moment of his life. Um, and so in that sense, the, the humanness of Jesus never changed, but the way that he was a human changed moment by moment. That's probably the closest analogy we can, we can uh, go with here. And this is a huge debate in theology, and maybe you know this debate, but um, it, it oftentimes sort of raises its head in the question of whether or not Jesus could ever sin. If Jesus has an eternal sinless nature, then he was never really tempted and could never really sin. But if he is a human with a human nature and humans can sin, you and I know this, <laughs> then the possibility for him to sin was on the table. Now, I'm like most Christians, I think it makes sense to say Jesus never sinned, but I wouldn't say he didn't sin because he had this nature that prevented it. I would say he didn't sin because he consistently responded positively to the Spirit of God calling him to love moment by moment. We're starting to get a little bit in the weeds here, but hopefully those, that answer kind of points you in the direction I would like to go in exploring that interesting topic. Yeah, I'd, yeah. Love, to, I'd love to chew on that with you a bit uh, at some, some other point. point. Uh, so, so that'd, that'd be, be good. good. Well, well, in recognition, recognition of time, time Tom, thank, thank you so much, much uh, for your work, work and the interview. interview.